let's have a little review on chapter two, one dimensional motion. Here we have an X axis labeled in meters, and it tells us the position of an object. If we could take a picture of this object, say every second, we might see something that looks like this if the object was moving at a constant velocity. Graphing position versus time, we get something like this. It's a straight line. And the slope of that line would be the change in position over change in time. That change in position is called the displacement. So that slope means the velocity. Of course, that velocity is constant. And like we said, if the flash rate was once every second, we would be getting a velocity of one meter per second. So we say that the slope of the position versus time graph gives us a velocity versus time graph. And the slope of the velocity graph gives us the acceleration graph. Well, there is no change in velocity. It's constant. So we end up with an acceleration that's zero. In our next example, we can see that the object is speeding up because the spacing in each flash is increasing. Assuming the camera goes off once every second, our strobe picture clearly shows an increase in speed. We can plot this out in a position versus time graph, and we'll see it curve up. How do we get the velocity? We could find the slope of a series of tangent lines. Of course, we find the slope is increasing, and if we're careful, for this data, it'll increase at a linear rate. So again, the slope of the position versus time graph gives us the velocity versus time graph. And the slope of the velocity will give us acceleration versus time. Now, if we were doing a lab, that would be experimental data. We really wouldn't have a necessarily an equation for this line. But I happen to know the equation for that data. You probably suspected it was a parabola, and you're right. So knowing this equation and that uh, its slope is what's going to give us the velocity, that would mean we need to take the derivative with respect to time. Again, that's saying the slope is the velocity, which would be the change in position over change in time, where the delta represents finite changes that we can actually observe. But in calculus, we talk about infinitesimal changes that would exist only for a very tiny little spot on that curve. The trick is to take the exponent, bring it down out in front and then subtract one from the exponent. And that's the velocity. And there's the equation from the position versus time. And that agrees nicely with the slopes of our tangent lines. Now we can do the same for the velocity versus time graph. Of course, the slope is going to be the acceleration, which is a change in velocity over the change in time. And that would mean taking the derivative of the velocity equation with respect to time. So we're going to write the dv over dt. And to take the derivative, we can imagine that t is actually t to the 1. Then we can imagine bringing the 1 out front and subtracting 1 from the exponent. Well, that's t to the 0, which is a 1. And we end up with the acceleration. Yeah, it's a constant. And that's what agrees with the graph. Well, is it possible to look at these graphs and go the other way? Start with the acceleration and generate the velocity graph, and from the velocity graph, generate the position graph. What would happen if I took the acceleration and I multiplied by a small interval of time? I would get a change in velocity, a very small change in velocity. I could keep doing that and then add up all those little changes in velocity to generate the velocity. Well, we can rearrange this formula and apply it to this graph. If we were doing algebra and we had finite values for these changes in velocity, we would add them up by using a summation sign. But if we have an infinite number of these tiny little changes in velocity, the delta is replaced with a d, and the sigma is replaced with an integral sign, meaning bring everything together. Add them all up. That's what integration means. We can see that the little change in velocity is the acceleration times the change in time. That's also observed here in this formula. So we'll replace this with acceleration times the change in time 
and we'll insert our variable t as t to the zero so we can perform the inverse of a derivative. The integral is the inverse of the derivative. That means we have to raise the exponent by one. And when we do that, that eliminates the dt. That's why the exponent went up by one. And then we multiply by the reciprocal of the new exponent. And we end up with our formula for velocity. So we're finding the area of an acceleration versus time graph to get the velocity versus time graph. Now you could have done this with algebra because we just have a simple rectangle here. But when these equations start to get crazy, you have to use calculus. Now when going from this graph to this graph, we don't have the information to tell us where the velocity begins. So unless you're told otherwise, start it at zero, but it could have had an initial velocity. As long as the slope is the same, it's the same acceleration. So when performing the integral, we usually add an initial value. While continuing on with this trend, could we find the area under this graph? And that would be velocity times time, which would be our position. So we can break up this graph into a bunch of rectangles, the area of which would be velocity times a small change in time, which would give me a small change in position. Well, now I have to add all of them up. So we could say that the position is equal to the sum of all of the little positions for each interval. The little change in position is the velocity times the little change in time. That's what we have here. And that velocity is the acceleration times time plus the initial velocity. Well, to do the calculus, we'll put an exponent for t and insert a t to the 0 here, which is just a 1. t to the 1 becomes t to the 2. And we multiply by the reciprocal of the new exponent t to the 0 becomes t to the 1. And we multiply by the reciprocal of that new exponent. And when the exponents rise by 1, we perform the integral, and that eliminates the dt. And of course, we're adding an initial position because this graph does not tell us where this graph starts. So we found the area under this graph to give us this graph. And that's the equation you know for kinematics. So in summary, we take the derivative or find the slope to go this way, and we take the area, find the integral to go that way. Now that last example was for constant acceleration. Well, what if we had an acceleration that was increasing? The last example was for constant acceleration, but what if we had an increasing acceleration? And that would be an initial acceleration. We call that a naught. Sometimes we use the letter I, sometimes we use a symbol naught. It's a linear equation. Again, if you took the area of all of this, that would be your velocity. So the acceleration times a change in time would be a small change in velocity. And of course, you can see that because acceleration is the change in velocity over change in time. And then I can bring the dt over to here. So how do I add up all those little changes in velocity? We integrate them. And that means integrating this side of the equation as well. Now you can think of integrating the little changes to give you the large finite change in velocity, which you can think of as the total area under this graph. To do the integral, we need to raise the exponent and multiply by the reciprocal of the new exponent. We do the same to this term. And in raising these exponents, we eliminate the dt and we have our overall change in velocity. And the change in velocity is going to be v minus v naught, which you can bring over to here. It's the same idea as just adding the constant. How can you check to see if this formula is right? Well, if we took the integral to get this formula, we should be able to take the derivative and get back to our original equation. Well, what is the derivative? It's the acceleration. It's the change in velocity over change in time. And that derivative would bring the two down and you'd have d times t. That's what you would get. You have a one up here, bring that down, subtract one from that exponent, you'd have a naught. And this would be zero because that's the same as having t to the zero, bring the zero down, that would eliminate that whole term. 
and you don't have a V initial up there. Well, what's that graph going to look like? The velocity versus time. It's a parabola. What's the meaning of V naught? That's how high we start the graph. What's the meaning of A naught? That's the initial slope of this graph. And the B tells us how quickly this graph is curving. That B appears in this graph as the slope. So how would I get position versus time? Yeah, it's the area under this graph. You'd want to take the velocity times that small change in time to get your change in position, and then integrate all those changes in position. So starting with our equation for velocity, we can rewrite velocity as the change in position over the change in time. Bring the dt over. Integrate all my little positions. And if I integrate this side of the equation, I have to integrate that side of the equation. Think of this as finding the overall change in position. Again, it's the area of the whole thing. So we raise this exponent by one, and then multiply by the reciprocal of the new exponent, and there's a half here too. So one third times a half is one sixth. Again, we have t to the one, raise it by one, multiply by the reciprocal of the new exponent, and we have our next term. Squeeze in a t to the zero here and do the trick, and you end up with v naught times t. Split this up into x minus x naught, bring the x naught over, and here we have it. There is your equation for position considering the acceleration increases at a constant rate, and that we have an initial acceleration, an initial velocity, and an initial position. And it'll give us a polynomial curve. Now we have three new equations to cover our kinematics. That covers a situation where the acceleration is increasing. And we can see that here in this equation. B represents the rate at which the acceleration is increasing and is known as jerk. Kind of like if you were backing out of your garage and you bumped into the car behind you, your head would jerk back. Yeah, the acceleration wasn't constant. The acceleration rose rather quickly. So what would happen if B was zero? You would just say that your acceleration remains constant. There's no time in this equation. And now that term would be eliminated, and you'd be left with this. And yeah, you'd have the same kinematics equations that you had before. Let's try an example. A car is traveling 30 meters per second when at time equals zero, the driver presses the brakes, so the acceleration goes from zero meters per second squared to four meters per second squared, in 10 seconds. We often see the word uniformly in problems like this, and that means that the acceleration went from zero to four in a linear fashion. Let's find the velocity at t equals 10 seconds. Since we can see that the acceleration is changing, you cannot use your old school kinematics formulas. You would like to use the formula for velocity, but you need to know what v is. Maybe we can find it from here. What's the initial acceleration? It's zero. And we're looking for b. What's the final acceleration? You might say it's four meters per second squared, but be careful, we're pressing on the brakes. You have to read the problem carefully. If we're traveling 30 meters per second forward and I'm pressing on the brakes, then that must be a negative acceleration. And the time is going to be 10 seconds. And B works out to be negative 0.4 meters per second cubed. We can see this on a graph of acceleration versus time. The initial acceleration is zero. And in 10 seconds, we're at negative 4 meters per second squared. The slope of that line is B. And the fact that that is a straight line, that's what we mean by uniformly. Now that I have B, I can go calculate my velocity. The initial acceleration is zero and my initial velocity is 30 meters per second. And we get 10 meters per second. And of course, we should be able to graph this on a velocity versus time graph. My initial velocity is 30 meters per second. At 10 seconds, we're at 10 meters per second. But how do you connect these dots? Is it gonna be a straight line? 
Nope, it's a parabola with an initial slope of zero because the acceleration initial was zero. With a final slope of negative four meters per second squared. Now we can ask, find x at t equals 10 seconds. Well, you're going to want to use this formula, of course. And it reduces to this because there's no initial acceleration, and we don't have an initial position, so we'll just assume it's zero. And this term turns into negative 66.6 .6 repeating meters and plus 300 meters due to our initial velocity. So we've traveled 233.3 meters. What's this look like on the position versus time graph? The initial position is zero. That initial slope is 30 meters per second. We're going forward, but we're slowing down, so the slope has to decrease. You could think of it like this. If there was no slowing down, the graph would just be a straight line, 30 meters per second times t. But we are slowing down, and this would represent the distance that we did not travel because we slowed. And we can see the same thing on the velocity versus time graph. We have an initial velocity. You can imagine what that would look like if it remained constant but we are slowing. That area represents the distance we've traveled. That rectangle would represent the distance that we would have traveled at a constant 30 meters per second. The missing area is the distance we did not travel because we're slowing down. So just what do you need to know for this chapter? Old school kinematics where the acceleration is constant. That forgotten formula. It's only going to work if the acceleration is constant. You need to know that the change in position is your displacement. How about your V average is the change in position over the change in time? But if you take the initial and final velocities and you average them, that's only going to work if the acceleration is constant. Well, I think you get the idea on the old school stuff. What about the new stuff? Well, this is only an example where V is constant, the rate of change of the acceleration. You have to be prepared for anything. You could be given an equation for position, in which case you would take the derivative to get the velocity. And then again, take the derivative to get the acceleration. Or you could be given an equation for acceleration, in which case you'll have to take the integral to get the area to find the velocity, from which you will take the integral to get the area to find your position. All your calculus could be checked with numerical integration, and if you can't do the calculus, that still should be an easy workable solution. And you should be able to do it in Quick Basic. So this video pretty much covered the new stuff for this year in AP Physics, but you're still expected to know all that you learned in honors physics from last year. Things like chase problems, all that graphing motion.